Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kim Schmidt. I'm the executive editor of Farm Equipment Magazine. Welcome to our latest webinar in conjunction with the North American Equipment Dealers Association. Today's presenters are Kurt Kleppel, CFO of Naida and president of Equipment Dealer Consulting, and Trent Hummel, a former dealer executive and a dealer institute instructor. They're going to be digging into the results of the latest cost of doing business study for us today. Before we get started with the presentation, just a couple of housekeeping items. On your screen, there's a control panel with a Q&A icon. You can submit questions here at any time during the presentation. Um, and if they're relevant to the slide we're, out, we're on, we'll try to answer them right away. Otherwise, we'll get to your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and then like always, we are recording today's webinar um, and it'll be shared with everyone who registered in the event you want to rewatch it later or share it with anyone else at the dealership. All right, we're ready to get started. Thanks again for joining us and I'll hand it over to you, Kurt. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank everybody that's uh, attending the webinar and I'd like to thank Iron Solutions uh, for being a sponsor of the Cost of Doing Business Study and also this webinar. And of course, I'd like to thank Farm Equipment uh, for putting on the webinar and, and also my good friend Trent Hummel, who's joining me uh, this year on the analysis of the 2023 study. So welcome, Trent. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Thanks for having me back. I've enjoyed doing it with you in the past and I'm sure we're going to have a good one today. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, uh, what we've seen and analyzed so far in the 23 study, uh, you know, it's been a pretty good year for the egg industry. Been a, more than a very good year. Great year. Best year I think I've seen in a long, long time. Yeah, and we thought 22 uh, study was pretty good for the 21 uh, data, but I think this one, uh, you know, it's got its plus and minuses. So we'll kind of go through that and and point out some of the highlights and some of the extraordinary highlights of the 23 study. Yep, yep. Oh, Kim, I can't advance my slide. Okay. Um, oh, there it goes. All right, good. Uh, history and methodology. Uh, cost of doing business study has been going on since 2005. Around May 1st, we request uh, dealers to send their statements to us, and dealerships have a few months to submit them. We usually go th through the end of July for submission, so uh, it's a brief history. I know. Most of you people have seen this over and over, so we might delete this slide for, for next year. <clears throat> and also the participating associations like, the, of course, NAIDA, uh, the Northeast uh, Equipment Dealers Association participated and the Deep Southern Farm Equipment Dealership Association participated this year. And, maybe and, mention and you get your free report for the dealerships that participated this year. And we also uh, have region-specific reports through uh, your association. And the big plus this year is the Canadian region. If you order the Canadian region report, you will get it in Canadian dollars, not converted to U.S. Correct. Correct. And that that's a big plus. Here's a map of, of the territory that's covered in the study. Of course, we've got most of Canada and then all of the United States and and the uh, light blue uh, region of the United States, the Naida region, and then the lavender, so to speak, color is the Northeast, and then the grayish color is the Deep Southern uh, Association that participated. Value of the cost of doing business study, uh, you know, the floor plan interest deduction and some other tax legislation regulations that passed in 2016. We used this study to do uh, to get those passed and, and, and it was involved in congressional hearings, too. So with the CODB, we uh, got the floor plan interest deduction passed where if you're a farm equipment dealership, you get 100 percent the floor plan interest deduction. Uh, lately, the past few years, has probably not been that big of a deal because of the low interest rates and the way people have been moving inventory, uh, very low interest was paid. But, you know, came, coming up uh, with 2023 uh, year ends and the way the interest rate is keeps increasing and increasing, uh, that could be a pretty big uh, 
important tax deduction uh, for 23 and 24 going forward. And also it sets benchmarks for the industry, helps businesses for mergers and acquisitions, especially as mergers so you can treat all the parties involved the same and with the same methodology and the same parameters and same metrics. Uh, it helps in estate planning big time uh, because IRS, you know, to defend the value of a dealership and the stock value of a dealership, the more industry data that you have, uh, the more the valuation is substantiated in IRS uh, eyes. So that's a real big key for the cost of doing business study. And also it helps DI trainers and other trainers and courses with inventory parts and service. And I, and I, I Trent would agree with that. Yeah, we use it all the time. We use it for lots of stuff, the DI trainers. But you also, we talked earlier today, Kurt, there's more bankers and lenders looking at the cost of doing business study. And now the, the vendors or the manufacturers, the OEMs are looking at the cost of doing business study just to see how their dealers are doing in the in financial reports. Yeah, that's correct. Because, you know, the, the manufacturers have all their data on their dealers, uh, of course. And then this study uh, can contributes to everybody, every make. So you got Deer, you got Adco, you got Kubota, you got Case, you got Ford New Holland, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the whole blend of the farm equipment industry. Yeah, it's very important for the manufacturers to know that their dealers are healthy. Mm -hmm. And like we were talking earlier, the cost of doing business reports is four reports. You got the Canadian report, you got the Northeast report, the Deep South report and the NEDA uh, report. And then you got the North American, well, the NEDA report is actually a North American report. I'd like to point out that the 23 uh, report is on 22 uh, information. And the 22 report was based on 21 information. So so I'll just comment on this. I, I find that the individual association or the regional reports are, I, I use them a lot more when I'm working with a dealer than the whole North America report. Just, just as a side note. There. Yeah. And, you know, and, and this here, you know, I, I concur Trenton, but I also like looking at the volume, uh, the section of the CODB. And this year we added another volume category. So the volumes are under 50 million in sales, 50 to 150 in sales, 150 to 350. And then our new category is volume over 350 million in sales. So when we start doing the comparison analysis and we start looking at the volumes, you'll see that the comparisons we're showing on the screens are for the first three volumes under 50 million, 50 to 150 million, and 150 to 350 million, because we can compare that to previous year's report. Since this is the first year we broke it out with 350 million or more, we don't have any data to compare that to, but next year we will. And as we go through, I'll make comments on what the, the higher volume over 350 million did and as far as ratios or inventory turns and things of that nature. So, and then once you get the report, uh, you can look at all the pages. It's 35 pages long. And it also includes five years of history with graphs and charts. So I think uh, everybody will like the report. Uh, one few things to point out, you know, uh, the North American averages, when we talk North American averages by per location basis. Um, and all the data for the North American averages are converted to US dollars. So all the Canadian dealers that reported, we converted that to US to come up with the North American averages per location. Now, when we're looking at the volume dealers, I, broken down in volume categories, those averages are based on the entity. So that's the average of the all the entities that participated or qualified in that category. So there's a little bit of a distinction between North American when we compare North American and when we compare the, the volume categories. And again, the 23 reports based on 22 data and the 22 reports is based on 21 data. Yeah, and the reports are laid out so simple and easy to read it. 
even non-financial people can look across the chart and and read on those 35 pages can read where they stand within those reports mm -hmm. and still happening mergers and acquisition we stayed about the same at about seven 0.2 compared to 7.4 is average location per dealership organization. Uh, we'll be seeing that change in the next year report because I know there's a lot of activity in 23 with six and seven uh, location stores merging together that happened in 23. There were several eight and nine location acquisitions uh, that happened in 23. So I think in the study next year, we'll probably see that average location per dealership organization uh, to be about 10 or 11, possibly. Yeah, and every time I talk to you, Kurt, you tell me about another couple of dealers that maybe they're not going to merge, but they're starting to talk. And it's just every time I talk to you, it's just another one and another one, and another one. I mean, your, your, your team is more in tune with that than I am, but it never stops, does it? It hasn't stopped for 10 years and it's not stopping at all going forward. No, in fact, you know, we started uh, with mergers and acquisitions back in the year of about 2003. So it's been, what, 20, 20 years ago. And it always seemed like, you know, when is it going to stop? And it, every year it almost seems like it picks up. And once you've come into a year where there's quite a few mergers and acquisitions, you think can it continue on? And it still is. And you know, there are so many different manufacturers involved that, you know, it's going to take a while to get uh, everybody merged together like uh, it should be or what, what could be anyway. Maybe not should be, but could be. <laughs> uh, looking at total sales uh, for whole goods, uh, new whole goods, we're at a little over uh, 12 million in 22. So we had a 17 0.6% increase. Use we had an 18.6% increase, but looking at this uh, chart, the biggest improvements in parts and service, I mean, parts at 21.9% increase over a year ago, and um, service uh, another 25.2% uh, increase over a year ago. And I, and I, and I think the New and the used whole goods would have been higher if we would have had the inventory to sell. We just didn't have it. It didn't arrive. Couldn't get it done. So, I mean, it would probably been right up there with the parts and service above 20% for each of those categories, but it just, the product wasn't there. Yeah, and I apologize uh, looking at this screen that we didn't catch it, but that first column says 2022, and that should actually be 2023. Oh, yes. Yeah, right over here. Yep. Yeah, so I'm, I apologize for uh, that because when I was looking at that, I'm, I was saying 22 and seeing over the other column, 22. So, I, but that's uh, it's 23 columns. So that's why we got a big increase. And total by location, you know, 24 million, 18.6% increase overall. And again, that's mainly from parts and service. Yeah. And if, you know, it's good to have the parts and service growing more than whole goods. I mean, that's where your higher margin dollars are in parts and service. So that's real cash flow. Sometimes whole goods doesn't always generate real cash flow. But an 18.6% from last year, that, that's that's great. Great. And then some turnover metric trends. Uh, total asset turnover for 2023 was low, right at three. You know, the asset to target is 2.5. So... We did well, a lot well better than the the average of two point five. Last year was two point seven. Uh, the average dealer for parts and whole goods inventory turns uh, for this past year was three point six. So that improved. Uh, it made a major improvement in twenty two compared to twenty one study. Uh, went from two point five to three point four, and then we still had a slight increase in inventory turns. So that's good. And then you see the inventory turned by volume 2.6 for under 50, 3, 450 to 150, and 3.7 to 150 and 350. And the inventory turned for dealers 350 million and greater was 3.2 times. So they're all, you know, at that inventory to target it of greater than three, except the uh, 
under a 50 million, they just were a little bit shy of it. And, and for the most part, I mean, this, this has been going in the right direction for five years here. I mean, and, and I hope for the next five years, we can keep this going up because that's my biggest Achilles heel is uh, too much inventory, not turning it fast enough. And we're just sucking all the cash out of the dealership, parking it in used inventory out there. So if we can keep this inventory turn going in this direction for the next five years, we could be five, six, maybe. I mean, we just have to get better at doing what we're doing. And we are obviously the last five years. Yeah, you know, and the way inventory is, is going, I think it's starting to to accumulate a little bit more in 23 at, at each dealership lot. But I think it's at a, at a pace that, you know, can maybe create more turns going forward. Yeah. Uh, whole good inventory as far as dollars uh, in 23, a little over 3.5 million, 38% uh, of the total assets. Uh, used equipment was a million eight, 20%. So total new was uh, 5.487 at 58%. So it did increase over last year's, which we thought it should because, you know, we had such a, a kind of like an inventory shortage for the 21 data year or the 2022 study. So we thought that it would increase and and it, it did, didn't it, Trent? And uh, the other problem with, I mean, this is a hard one that none of us are going to ever be able to calculate is the the increase, the price increases on this inventory is so much, is, is driving the dollars bigger and maybe not the unit sales, just the dollars are bigger sometimes. Yeah, and if you look at uh, the greater than 350 million as far as percent of assets for new and used equipment, they were at 59.49%. Uh, so just a little bit more than the North American average. Yeah. Uh, dealership equity, uh, nice, uh, still nice, healthy percentages there. So the average dealer, three point seven two five million in equity at thirty nine and a half percent by volume under fifty million thirty nine point three. Uh, next category thirty nine point one one fifty to three fifty thirty eight point seven two and. Over 350 million was at 40.39 percent. So all of them, you know, we we saw some nice increases over uh, last year, except for under 50 million. They kind of went down a little bit, 45 to 39 percent. But uh, I don't see that as being alarming. In fact, I think uh, that's probably uh, evident of some tax planning and, and a lot of them are sub S corps. And so I think they probably took the profits that they made in the 22 study and took them out in on the 23 study. So I think that's part of the equity percentage decrease. And, and that's always the one thing a dealership needs to do is when it's great to have lots of high equity in the dealership, but what is that? What is that equity? Is it cash? And that's great if it's cash. But when you have too much cash or too much cash flow, sometimes dealers get sloppy in operations. So I don't want to say you want to run yourself thin on cash, but too much makes you lazy also. The other thing about equity is I always worry about is oh, we, we show lots of equity, but is it all the cash that we had paid up and tied in or tied up and paid inventory? That kind of equity isn't isn't favorable. So when you do look at your equity, you got to really tear into it and see what is my equity in this store? What Where is it positioned? Yeah, and it kind of proves I'm looking at uh, what actual cash percentage was as percent of assets for less than 50 million, and and the cash was at 16.29 percent in, in the 2022 study, and it's 11.27 in 2023. So it looks like they paid some cash distributions out to lower that equity percentage. Yeah, and they took some money out of the business, and that's great. They paid the shareholders some yeah. return on their investment. Good. Well. Yeah. Now, debt to equity, we would think that, you know, this would coincide with, you know, the equity percentages increasing that uh, we'd have a low debt to equity uh, ratio. And, and we have every dealer is 1.5. 1, 1 and as you can see, kind of, and that's correct. <laughs> it's kind of hard to believe all of them were 1.6, but 
you know, a little bit of it's due to rounding, but still kind of odd that each one of them were 1.6. Yeah. And how do we get 1.5? That's just a, that's just a function of rounding is all that is. Yeah. How we get the average dealer. And then debt to asset ratio, um, uh, 60.5% for the average dealer and fairly consistent, uh, with the different volume categories, 60.7, 60.8, 61.3. Of course, the target's 80% or less. So you can see that uh, we're in good shape as far as that uh, asset ratio leverage percentage. Any banker that grabs these numbers is going to be very impressed with their client when they see this kind of numbers, these results. Yeah. Trying to see if I can find uh, that uh, equity. Well, total debt for three greater than three hundred fifty million in sales was fifty nine point six one, so they're a little bit less. But in that fifty nine point six one on the over three fifty million would that be in this dealer average of sixty point five? Uh yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, that's a good question, Trent. I mean, the, the greater than 350 million sales is included in the North American average. Yes, that's okay. correct. Yeah. Uh, whole goods gross margins, uh, new equipment gross margin, 844 compared to 767. So it was 7% of the gross margin. Um, didn't raise much in percentage, but Dollar wise, uh, a real healthy increase. Used equipment, same same deal, except it participated more in uh, the gross margin percentage, eight point eight percent compared to six point six. Big total increase in dollars, though. Yeah, and any yeah, go ahead, Trent. We've talked about this for years. If you're in the used equipment iron in business, and and you're doing a lot of used. Your new inman, your new equipment gross margin should be lower than your used equipment margin. It's, it's just the healthy way to run the business. And of course, every store is a little different because it depends on how much use you're doing. But if you're taking a lot of used equipment on trade, your margins on new should be lower than used. And here we hit a home run this year with it. Now, part of it is because a guy, if he wanted to buy a tractor in 2022, in the calendar year 2022, his best deal was the one that he was looking at right then. Cause if he waited a half hour, he was going to miss that tractor. He had to buy it right then. And he had to pay the margin, whatever the dealer was asking. Yeah. So, and don't you uh, think that some of it, like in the 2022 study, you know, new, new inventory was a little bit more than what dealerships had for used inventory. So I think maybe that's why you're seeing a higher gross margin percentage a year ago also too. So it kind of, Depends on the availability of that type of inventory too, right? Sure. Yeah. And even the margin, look at the margin or the dollars. There's still whatever, 250,000, 260,000 more in new margin, new margin mm -hmm. dollars, new equipment margin dollars. Yeah. Part sales, uh, get healthy increase again, 2022, 2.9 and 23, 3.6. So 21.9% increase, which is huge. Uh, part sales mix, you're still a little bit behind 14.9%. But I think yesterday when we were going through this, Trent, you made a, a comment on that. Well, I know our target is 20 plus. It's just going to be very hard to hit when the price of new iron is so high. And so when you do a deal, your your parts prices are not crawling up in increasing in value or increasing in price as much as whole goods and you're just gonna struggle to hit 20 percent. if you are that's great but boy as these big ticket items get to be a million dollars and it's going to be hard for parts to ever get up to that 20 percent. so i'm not really as worried about the mix when i when i can't when i know why the mix isn't balanced i always go over and look at absorption rate and we'll see that here shortly mm -hmm. And then look at parts gross margins uh, by dollars, 1.2 compared to 9.29. Uh, so we're at 34.3% margin percentage. 
you know, the target's at 32%. So a nice healthy increase because 22 dropped from, you know, 21 when we had a good 35.3% margin percentage. So it's nice to see that margin percentage back up to 34.3%. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not as fussy on the margin percent. I like looking at the margin dollars. There's another $300,000 coming in on parts that we can pay our bills with. And I, I'm not saying I don't look at margin percent all the time, but boy, I like those margin dollars, an extra 300 grand to pay bills. That's, that's tremendous. Yeah. And then looking at service sales, uh, service revenue, nice health increase there too, 1.2 to 1.5, uh, 25.2%. Service sales max, again, it's kind of like the parts um, sales max, you know, still a little bit below target, but, you know, still a nice healthy increase over 22 amounts. Yeah, and it's a, it's a sales mix. Service sales mix is the same as parts. Just as new whole goods are high priced, it's hard to keep up. But the the one thing I noticed in two thousand, the calendar year two thousand twenty two, when these numbers were are from, when a guy had a choice, uh, you know, he brought his machine in, and there was an eighteen thousand dollar work order. In the old days, he might whittle it down to fourteen to say, "I yeah, don't fix this, don't fix this." Well, he didn't do that in two thousand, the calendar year two thousand twenty two. He just said, "Well, fix it all." He had the cash flow. So a lot of this is just because guys would spend the money. They had it. And the real interesting thing here is the service revenue. It's up $300,000, $305,000. And it's almost mirrored what parts is. So they together, they brought in just over $600,000 per location of gross margin dollars to pay bills with. Uh-huh. Yep. Which helps to the bottom line. That's for sure. And then service gross margins, again, Nice, healthy margin dollar increase, uh, 934 compared to 803. Uh, again, the percentage went down uh, a little bit, but still above the target of 60%. So, you know, again, the margin dollars of what, uh, 130, 130, yeah. yeah. So, pretty nice. Yeah. And then total expenses. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of I like on trend. I like to look at the dollars increase, which is you know three hundred and some thousand dollars, which isn't too bad. And the percent of, of revenue eleven point nine, so that went down. So that's a good thing. And and the target's less than twelve and a half percent. But you just can't always focus on expenses as a percent of revenue, though either. No, and I was just telling Kurt yesterday, everyone that. Anytime I go into a dealership and I look at their expenses as a percent of revenue and it's under 10, without knowing anything, I know that they're making money. It's So as we can get that number down, that's great. And this 2.6 to 2.9, just remember that $300,000 for another slide here coming up forward. Profit from operations. Uh, average dealer, uh, 1.267 for 23 as you can see, a big dollar jump uh, from 22 at 759. So that's what almost 500. Yeah, more. So that's that's a big healthy increase. And then operating profit as percent of revenue, uh, average dealer is 5.2 percent, less than 50 million, 4.4, uh, 50 to 150, 5.2, 150 to 350, 5.3. Target is greater than five, so I mean greater than four. So every volume category breached that, and then plus the average dealer at five point two compared to twenty two to three point seven. That's a nice, healthy increase. Well, and and look at down at two thousand nineteen. Yeah, three hundred thirty five thousand dollars, and now we're at one point two million. I and look at the percentages. We've done very well the last five years at cleaning up things and getting getting ourselves in position to make some money probably changed some processes, some procedures, got some people in place. And I've seen this profit operation target of greater than four. A few years ago, it was greater than three. I know some dealers that won't tolerate anything less than five. They want five minimum because that's what they feel is a good return on their investment. So I, I just hope we can hold this for years and years to come. Yeah, and, and uh, greater than 350 million uh, profit from operations uh, was 5.35. Pretty steady. So just a little bit, a little bit more, but not much. Yeah. 
Now we look at the returns, uh, return on assets, a uh, huge jump. I mean, from 12.6 to 17.5%. Uh, and then return on equity, another big jump, 34.2% to 44.5%. So uh, pretty outstanding, really. Yeah, I, you know, the banker's got to be doing, uh, feeling very good about his client and the owners of these dealerships have just got to be their chest out. Like, this is what you're in business for right here this year. Mm -hmm. Employee averages, uh, we had about 23.7. Now, this is per location uh, in the 23 study compared to 23.1 in 22. Total store revenue was 24 million compared to 20 million uh, revenue per employee, one just right over a million bucks and compared to 891 uh, a year ago. Yep, this goes nowhere right up. And I, I know this, depending on what your store sells, you might not be a million. That's why I put down here about a million per employee. Sometimes it might only be 750,000. If you're a Canadian dealer in the big iron business, you might be at 1.3, 1.4, because that stuff is so expensive and you're doing so much of it and that's all you're really doing. So about a million is really a loose kind of term, I guess. You need to know where you should be at. Yep. And then gross margin per employee uh, by volume, uh, 136,000 for less than 50 million, 224,000 for 50 to 150, 161,000 for 150 to 350. And most of that was an increase, as you can see from a year ago, except for less than 50 million, just a slight decrease. And the uh, gross margin per employee for greater than 350 million was uh, 140,000 for those, for that group. So just a little bit less than the 150 to 350. Uh, volume at 161. And and when I did this with you, Kurt, in 2019, I really picked on that, the 50 to 150 million dealers, because I, I said, if they didn't pull up their socks, they were going to run into trouble. And I got a few phone calls at home after that webinar that <laughs> you and I did. And guys were kind of saying, you're beating us up, beating us up pretty bad here. Well, <laughs> they, they have cleaned up their act. They gone from 90 to 224. This is tremendous. They've got what they've done is they figured out how to run a three, four, five, six store operation. They were running it like a one or two store operation, but what they've done the last four or five years is figured out how to run it and take advantage of the synergies and the processes and the people that they have. They can take advantage of all the, the pressures that the OEM puts on you and the industry puts on you because now you're big enough that you can handle some of that stuff without really having to drain the bank. So they, I tip my hat to that group because they've really figured out how to run a multi-store organization from what they did five years ago. Yeah, and what's real interesting, Trent, is that the average for that group uh, is 104 employees. And the year before in 2022 study, it was uh, 70 employees. So they increased their employees, but still managed to increase the gross margin per employee. And I'll bet then they've added another store or two if they've gone from 70 to 104. Yeah. So good for them. They're adding stores comfortably and doing it profitably on the first year. Good for them. Yeah. Parts and service absorption. Uh, I'll let you handle this one, Trent. Well, the absorption target on the screen is 100. But if you look in the cost of doing business study, it references 80. The 100%, guys, is what? A few dealers are using because it's the way that you compare it to the heavy truck or the heavy uh, construction industry, even automotive. But what those industries are doing with absorption is they're backing out all their variable selling expenses when they calculate that. So they do have 100. In the ag industry, we don't back out any variable selling expenses, whole goods expenses. We leave them all in there. So... If you if you can hit over 100 and still have your variable selling expenses, that's great. I mean, you're hitting a home run. But for most dealers, if you can get above 80 with your variable selling expenses still calculated in the formula, then my hat goes off to you. You're doing just fine. Now, we haven't had anybody here at 80, do we? Nope. Oh, but uh, the uh, 
greater than 350 million in sales. Their parts and service absorption was uh, 82.73 percent. Good for them. Good, good. We're working on getting that better. It's just going up and up because we're getting better at our operations in every one of these. So th this is looking positive. We're going in the right direction. We've been preaching on this for 30 years probably. And this is how we pay our bills in the store. And when Whole Goods has a soft year, parts and service can pay all the expenses. Yeah, and, and quite a bit of an increase from 22, of course, because we're looking at 66% for the average dealer to 75%. So nice, healthy jump. So if we can make another 5% increase, the average dealer will be right at that 80% mark. Yep. Yep. All right. So uh, equipment dealer consulting is a public accounting firm. Uh, you know, so if you need uh, any type of service and audits, reviews, and compilations, 401k audits, uh, please give us a call and Trent, I think we're going to make a comment. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the sales. So, so, so everyone, we increased our our store sales, individual store sales, on average from twenty million to twenty four. Now, mostly, what happens is we increase our store sales, and we, yeah, we make some more gross margin dollars, but we spend exactly that amount of money in expenses. So we really don't put any more money at the bottom line. That's not what happened on this study. That's not what happened in the year 2022. We sold $4 million more per location. We grossed 800,000. We only spent 300,000 in expenses. So we netted $500,000. That means on the $4 million, we got a 12 and a half percent net return on that extra $4 million. You could call it incremental sales. In an industry where we're hoping to get three, four or 5% net on our total revenue dollars, we got 12 and a half on that extra four. And that that's commendable. That's uh, that's something to say, to speak to. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen that before on that, that much money, incremental dollars, getting that kind of net income. Yeah. And, and I think also, you know, the, I think we talked about it earlier, but you know, the total inventory is a percent of assets. Um, you know, I, less than 50 million in sales they were at 74 percent which is fairly small i mean you know we've always before in earlier years like 2018 2019 you know that total inventory amount as a percent of assets could be as high as 80 85 percent right yeah. so you know that's gone down so i think and then the 50 to 150 is at 64 and a half percent total uh 150 to 350 is at 70 might as well say 72%. And then greater than 350 million, they're at 73 and a half percent total inventory as a percent of assets. So, you know, it seems like, you know, they're maybe they're managing their inventory maybe just a little bit better than what was happening. And, and some of it's also availability and also um, the sales that are going on too, of course. Well, and for the most part, I'll tell you what's going on in the calendar year 2023 is I, from probably the middle of June and all through July and August into September, I've seen a lot of dealerships use auctions or some way to liquidate excess combines. And I know this isn't a combine only cost of doing business study, but it seems like almost everything else on the yard was in check. But at the end of 2022, We've got rid of all our cherries and we got rid of every tractor and everything else. And maybe there's some 4 or SB choppers around, stuff like that. But but those combines, I still think we had excess inventory. And then the government started up in the interest rates and dealers like, oh, you just got too much of this stuff. So I'm seeing a lot of combines right now go to auction or some way of liquidating it. And then I just pulled off the report from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers and and right now, guys, I got to tell you, up to the end of September in 2023 calendar year, we've sold 7,100 new combines, which is way too many. It's going to generate about 24,000, 21,000, 24,000 trades in a market that historically only sells about 18. So you're going to have about 6,000 carryover, plus whatever you're sitting on your yard right now. So just keep that in mind that we are selling an oodle of new stuff that generates about three, three and a half trades for each new one. 
That's how that market works. It's not a trouble with four-wheel drives. Um, the other the other products don't seem to be as much. They're not as big volume, but uh, I, that's what I'm seeing going on right now. Yeah, and then you mentioned 2023. I think you know what I've seen so far in 2023. You know, dealerships had pretty good first seven, eight, nine months of of sales and and bottom line profit. It's going to be interesting, I think, to see what happens the last few months of the year and going forward into 2024, uh, especially regarding interest rates, the way they're escalating. I can't see that uh, stopping yet. I mean, because, you know, they still talk about the inflation and keeping inflation uh, down. So that's one of their strategies is higher interest rate, keep inflation down. So that's going to kind of bear in on what inventory levels you might see or might not see. Uh, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see exactly how 23 shakes out. But I know a lot of dealerships that have had a uh, pretty good first seven or eight months of the 23 year, though. And and we've talked about that in 2000, the calendar year 2022 we talked about when is this going to end because it was so hot, but it's got to end. And some guys said 23, some guys said 24. Nobody knew that interest rates were going to go up that fast over a six month period. Mm -hmm. And we're in an industry where everything is high priced. Doesn't matter if it's land or machinery or trying to hire people, it's high priced. So in the 2004 study, we're going to probably have a slide about how much interest, inventory interest we had to pay because it is, a significant amount of our cash flow is being used to pay inventory interest right now, which wasn't the case in the last five years, really. Well, since 2008, since the housing crisis, right. our interest rates have been stupid low and it's, it's pretty much got a lot of young guys in trouble because they don't know that five and six and seven percent is actually normal. Three is uh, three is yeah. a gift. Two is a gift. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's so it's going to catch a lot of people by uh, with a little bit of a shock. That's for sure. Yeah. And then we got Dealer Institute as part of uh, NAIDA and with the training and consulting, which uh, Trent is a part of too. And, and we offer public courses, on-site training, on-site consulting, performance groups, uh, management systems, and ask the ex expert. Uh, so if you got any kind of questions, just give us a holler. And Michael Piercy is the vice president of dealer development. Does a gr great job in that. So if you have any questions or want more information on training and the services that are involved, uh, give Michael a call and there's his uh, email address. Yeah, they, the, the Dealer Institute, because of their breadth of instructors, they, they, there's a lot of things that are thrown at us that we wouldn't have thought as a course or something that we need to work on with a dealer. And there's one of the seven and even there's a few other that Michael doesn't have mentioned here that he's got some experts in his back pocket that, Hey, he can find a guy to help with that or with this. So, so give Michael a call whenever you're struggled with something. Yeah. And then, like you say, they're all have industry experience that's specific to the ag industry too. So that's a big key. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we'll uh, open it with, questions and we will hopefully provide an answer to you. If we can't, we'll uh, get the information and, and get you an answer uh, before the week is out. Kim, do we have any questions? Yeah, we have one. So just a reminder to use, there's a QA and a uh, icon that you can submit questions through. Um, just to clarify, in, in all the tables that you guys shared, that over 350 million group was included in all those averages, correct? Correct. That's correct. They were included in the North American average. Correct. Okay. And I don't and, I don't remember if we covered it uh in the beginning of this one or just in our uh conversations earlier. Yeah. How yeah it's broken out because there was no comparable data yet. Uh, right. And the reason we didn't break it out and have it comparable to the year before is that we didn't break it out before so this year we had quite a bit of activity and financial statements uh that had over 350 million in sales so that's why we started it that category in fact it was kind of recommended or suggested 
by various dealerships uh, to maybe uh, expand that the volume group. And so we did. Uh, so next year we should have com comparables on, on that group too. So and we'll go through it slide by slide like we did last this year. All right. And then also, uh, you know, I don't know how many outdoor power equipment dealerships are on the call, but we actually did an outdoor power equipment cost of doing business study uh, this year uh, based on 22 data compared to 21 data. So if anybody's interested in just an outdoor power equipment cost of doing business study, uh, give us a call and, and we'll get you set up. And we plan on continuing to do that too. We used to do it and then we kind of got uh, lost interest or whatever happened, but uh, now we have renewed interest in, in that uh, group of dealerships. Right. We did get another question in. Um, on the turnover metric slide, uh, just to confirm, was the parts turn the first chart on the left? If you want to go back to that one. Uh, the one on the left is total asset turn. And then the one on the right is for uh, parts and whole goods inventory turn. So this first column, though, is actually average dealer for parts inventory and then broken down by volume. Okay. I think the question, though, was, was this column over here to the very far left it, that was for total asset turnovers okay okay and your total assets include your parts your whole goods all your trucks all your shelves all your chairs all your computers any asset that's in that in that building might even be the building if if it's within the operating company so yep. that's total assets is every <clears throat> pen and every stapler everything so in the full report, does it break down parts turnover and whole goods turnover separately then? Yes. But this slide, it, it does not. That's right. Okay. Yeah, because in the study, we got um, a page with all the different ratios, and that's where you'll see the inventory turnover ratio and things of that nature, accounts receivable ratio, fixed asset ratio, and then of course the total asset uh, ratio. And then just as a reminder, I guess to folks, if they didn't participate in the, um, in the study, but they're interested in receiving it, how do they uh, they, can contact, they can contact. They can contact NAIDA, or they can contact the Northeast uh, Region Association if they're part of that group, or they can contact Deep South uh, with that group, or they can contact if they're Canadian dealer, they can call uh, NAIDA of Canada and get the study from them too. But they all can call into NAIDA, of course, and we'll we'll get a study to them. It'll, it'll have, you know, be a paid for, you know, pay for study, but since they didn't participate, but if they participated, then they get it for free. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? We still got a few minutes uh, before we got to wrap it up, if there are any more questions out there. Again, I'd like to thank, you know, Farm Equipment for putting on this webinar. I'd like to thank Iron Solutions for sponsoring uh, the Cost of Doing Business Study and also part of the, this webinar. And, of course, I'd like to thank my good friend Trent, uh, who, who brought very good insight on all the different slides and, and his knowledge of the industry and, and of these numbers. So, uh, Thanks for everybody that uh, was online. Uh, appreciate it. And if you got any questions or comments, uh, email us at NAIDA or call us and uh, we'll take those into consideration. All right. Well, no other questions have come through, so we'll wrap things up. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the recording of this webinar will be available on the Farm Equipment website um, in case you want to go back and watch it or share it with anyone else at the dealership. 
Keep an eye on your email and the farm equipment newsletters for more information on when that's available. On behalf of Kurt, Trent, the NAIDA team, and the farm equipment staff, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. There'll be a short survey that pops up once you leave the webinar. If you could let us know what you thought. Um, and as always, you can reach out to me directly with any topics you'd like us to cover in the future. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.